All right. Welcome everyone to our special interview on mental health mastery. Boy, do we have a story for you guys. And um, I'm, I've been looking forward to this one for quite some time now, ever since we got back from Thailand, because as you're, he you're about to hear shortly, there's going to be a very funny story for most of you. But at the time, it was anything but funny. I mean, looking back, we can laugh on it now. But coming out of it, we've noticed we've got a lot more clarity. We've got a lot more focus and want to share the lessons that we learned based on the problems we face. And we've noticed a lot of other people are facing in their everyday life. Um, and we'll be sharing tips on that. But I'll share more on what we're teaching in today's one shortly. And um, any, once again, guys, welcome to tonight. And before we get things started, any words that you want to open with, Warren? Oh, well, yeah, I can't, couldn't agree with you more, Ed. We, it was an absolutely, um, yeah, indescribable experience. That's all I can say. <laughs> Something that you don't see coming, but in hindsight, you look back and go, I certainly needed that. It's just changed the whole world view, and that's really pretty much all I can say for now. Mm, yeah, I can agree more, but we'll get to the story shortly. And I guess what I wanted to start off with, but before we actually get started, if everyone could put in the chat where you're tuning in from, because I know there's quite a few people here from a mixture of Awaking Within. I also know there's quite a few people from Global Wealth Club. So it would just be interesting to see you know, where everyone's tuning in from, just so we can get an idea. We are here, both me and Warren from Perth, WA. Um, see someone from Melbourne and probably going to be all sorts of places. Perth, yeah, Perth as well. Albany. Queensland, Sunshine Coast, Brisbane, Brisbane as well. Where nice and spread across Australia, Cairns. So yeah, a lot of different places and it's really good to see. But um, yeah, I guess what I want to start off in today is uh, interview before I, we um, are getting to the questions I've got prepared is that um, everything that we'll be sharing, I mean, I'll, I know Warren will give his own disclaimer, but as usual, we always do have to give disclaimers in the, whether it's in the financial or health space, just because we aren't licensed to give advice on this. So keep in mind, everything we're sharing today from is just purely from our own experience, everything that we learned on what we went through. And we believe it can help a lot of you, but obviously um, take parts of it at, as you will. Um, some parts that Warren and I share will resonate with you, other parts won't. Just know that none of this is advice, it's just purely sharing um, education from our own experience that we've learned. So anything that you want to say on that before we get into it, Warren? No, look, again, yeah, look, obviously there's licensed professionals in an area, we're just sharing our story and tools that can help. Mm. And the other thing too I'll mention is that We'll be uploading this replay to YouTube. So if you can't stay on until the end because you have other commitments to go to, this video will also be uploaded on YouTube. And what we'll do is we'll timestamp um, in the YouTube description. So then you can skip to the parts you want. And actually, um, there'll be clear segments rather than seeing like a one hour long video, however long it goes for. You can, you'll be able to see the timestamps and segments that we'll be covering today. So there's a bit more structure than kind of um, talking and rambling all over the place. But the first thing that the first question I had for you, Warren, before we go into our experience and sharing the story and giving people a good entertainment or comedy show, as well as informative education, um, I just wanted to I'll get your perspective on mental health, because we all know mental health is a word that's commonly used today. A lot of people are advocating for it, but um, some people just don't know what it actually means. Why is it important to actually have control over your mind right now? Um, and what was the reason we decided to host this? Oh, it's hard question to answer. All I, all I know is after what happened in that experience, it was such a disruptive, shocking experience that I, the one thing you walk away with is you realize that your mind, your soul is everything, that your body is just a vehicle, but you're jumping in to drive around on this planet Earth. And if your mind's fucked, you're really fucked, excuse the, um, the raw French. And... I having gone, I went through mental health 25 years ago, and then in a way, having another taste of it again the last few months of going through the sense of I was going crazy and mental, my mind just falling apart. And then, of course, Thailand sorting me out with a horrific, disruptive experience 
it's just given me such an appreciation for the importance of the mind and mastery of the mind and your mental health and having tools and mechanisms to cope and support you while you're going through a time of absolutely radical change on the planet where we're shifting into a new way of being a new way of thinking and you know new technologies and everything so ah uh, yeah it's just everything really i mean if your mind's fucked you it, as as i think we we both now know and you and uh and you're, and you're not happy everything else in your life doesn't work whereas you can have other problems in your life you can have cash flow issues you can have you know health issues in your physical body but if your mind's in a good state you can you can make it work whereas the other way around it's much worse do you also i i, I agree with everything you just said but um i'll give my take on this after i hear yours but do you think most people could be going through mental health challenges um even if it's a minor thing at some level without realizing it or do you think because oh, when it's... when you hear the word mental health challenges people associate that with um thinking they have to be fucked up and they're depressed or something or they're going through a lot of trauma but do you think most people in today's world actually are facing those challenges even if they don't realize it well what, what, what i will say is this i can't speak for everyone but i've been astounded how many people i'm meeting who I respect and I regard as strong people who are really got their shit together, who've admitted to me privately the last three or four months they have not been coping, that they're getting mental health management strategies or they've gone on medication or they've gone into, into sort of counselling and therapy of some kind. So I think it's a growing problem and I'm, I'm, I'm relieved that it's acknowledged in the world because when I went through mine 25 years ago, doctors would kind of look at me and like, you know, you're making it up, man, and it wasn't recognised like it is now. So if anything, too much to the other extreme, but there's no question a lot of people go through it. And we have these coping mechanisms for trauma, you know, as we, as our, as our whole view and our dreams get shattered and we see things change in the world and our trust structures like governments or whatever else, we either face our pain and the raw agony, which most people and myself was included in a way, don't really want to do it. So we find coping mechanisms, we distract with our phones, with coffee, with sex with drugs with alcohol with whatever with addictions um so yeah i think a lot of people are going through it and i think if many people here are really honest i think a lot of people would admit that at various levels you've been really experiencing and feeling a lot and that's why you're here today mm -hmm. i agree with it and i think mental health can come at like a lot of different levels especially when you've got everything going on in the world with different laws being passed and recently being through COVID. at some level um, people would have picked up the trauma and emotions like I know for myself those um, I know a few people on listening to this would know me and all that but I I obviously never thought I had mental health problems like it never crossed my mind and um, before the whole experience I thought I was fine and all that just going along my way but feeling pretty good about myself and all that but um, after going through it and feeling like it kind of cleansed me to a degree, I realized how much I was actually holding, whether it was my own or from other people. Um, so I noticed I was quite, I lacked a bit of focus and got distracted quite easily. And that prevented me from being able to do certain things in my career and stay focused. And whenever I was writing or, or doing anything else, whereas I feel like I've come out of it a lot better. And that's due to being able to work on mental health. Yeah, well, I mean, imagine if you're a farmer, just one example of many, who you built your life, you're building food, you build it, you build that, you've you built your land just in the family. Then some people in suits sitting in an office in a city somewhere, hundreds of miles away, go, oh, we're going to pass some obscure law to protect some possible um, rights, which means you can't do anything on your farm anymore to produce food unless you go and do X, Y, Z and pay us all this money. And I mean, and you know, for it's just a very blatant you know grab grab for money or grab for security but it just erodes your security your trust structure everything so yeah it's look i i agree with you i didn't realize i knew i was going through some anxiety and some stuff but the experience just shocked me how much i was going through and it's just bringing such a profound radical change i feel like i've been born again <laughs> the same experience i had when i had a powerful experience in a church 35 years ago i feel like i just got born again again that's how i'm feeling right now yeah and i do think a lot of people carry a lot of emotions like i didn't realize how much emotions i was carrying but um we'll get to that more shortly once we break the whole story down um before we move on to the next point and actually get into the story um anything you want to add to what we were just speaking about or are you ready to get into I was it? Just getting into it yeah all right well 
basically I'll let you take it from here sharing the story and I'll just jump in share my perspective afterwards and um first we'll hear your perspective on the story Warren and what you went through yourself oh. and I'll share mine yeah well I think it's actually better if you start if you share it in yours and I'll elaborate because you'll share it more simply than me so you share your version then I'll share it that's what I reckon yeah yeah okay so those of you um you've probably read some of the emails that we've sent out and um some of the texts that we've put out but in summary what the story was was that we went for a trip um for a week in Thailand this was about one week ago we um were in Thailand and on the last day of our trip second last day I mean we uh, both Warren and I are riding our scooters with my other brother James and um what happened then was we drove about 25 minutes from the hotel, stopped by at a cafe, and we saw a sign that said they sold um, cannabis brownies. Because for those of you that know Thailand, weed is now completely legal, and you can pretty much see any, uh, you can pretty much buy weed on every corner street. Like there's um, stores that sell them literally everywhere. So we pulled over to one, thinking nothing of it. We each order ourselves one um, brownie for each of us. We didn't order one between us, we ordered one each. Those of you that are familiar with cannabis, we didn't realize it at the time, but we thought it'd just be a light snack to maybe slightly relax ourselves and try out a bit of cannabis and have some fun with it. But um, we didn't realize a full cannabis brownie, how strong it actually was. So we ate it. Um, within about four minutes, the cannabis brownie is gone into our stomachs and we walk off on our merry way. We then go to a massage parlor, get massaged for about one hour and a half each. Um, and as soon as the massage finished, uh, I know for myself, I just, I knew it straight away. Like I was, I knew I was, something was up and um, I just felt dizzy, blurred and didn't know what was happening to me. I'm, I'm just thinking like, oh fuck, how am I, what the fuck's happening to me? And um, make my way down the stairs and just sit down because I'm waiting for Warren to finish his massage. Um, James and I are waiting on the chair and I feel like I'm completely zoned out and out of nowhere, I start panicking, just thinking, just thoughts that didn't even feel like mine came to me. Like I still felt semi-conscious in my body, but um, then then I just get a sudden rush of emotions and thoughts that didn't even feel like mine. But they, but I also was experiencing all of it, and I just start getting thoughts like, "How the fuck am I going to ride back my motorbike? I'm panicking right now. I can't drive back. I'm going to crash." I feel dizzy. I can't see really well. And um, I'm, we're 25 minutes away. Am I going to have to sleep on the streets and then go back tomorrow? What's going to happen? I have to return my scooter. And uh, all of these different thoughts coming through my mind. And uh, yeah, I knew I wasn't in the state to bring it. Warren comes down and I tell him that I can't do it anymore. Like I can't uh, ride my scooter back. So I tell him that he's going to have to ride the scooter back, um, come back in a taxi pick me up and take me back to the resort and I'm going to try to go to sleep there and hopefully this passes. So that's what we did. I crossed the road, wait, was waiting at a pub, um, like on a beanbag chair while Warren went off to drive the scooter to return it to the rental place. Um, I'm just lying back with my own thoughts. Like I felt like my soul kind of disconnected from my body. I don't know how else to put it. That's what it felt like. It felt like my soul literally left my body and I was kind of having to control myself, even though I didn't feel like I was in the state too. Um, my peripheral vision was blurred. So even crossing the road to get to the pub, I Warren had to tell me when it was safe to cross because I couldn't see um, on the side. It was just all blurred. I was so narrow focused that all I could see was what was in front of me. Um, and as I'm waiting on the beanbag chairs, I just start feeling a lot of emotions, like something's going to happen to me. I don't feel safe. And um, all of these other emotions going on. Um, time says I was like it's filled down, like five minutes felt like it was about an hour or something. Um, whatever I was feeling in the moment, I felt a thousand times worse than I would in my normal state. So if I felt anxious, I'd feel that anxiety a hundred times worse than I would normally. If I felt calm, I felt calm a um, hundred times more than I would. So anyway, um, a bit of time passes. Warren comes back in the taxi. I get back to the resort and go try to go to sleep in, in the bed once I'm there. So when I'm trying to sleep, though, I close my eyes and couldn't sleep at all. Like I got no sleep that night pretty much because what happened was 
I felt like I was trapped in my own mind. Like it, as I said before, I felt like I left my body and um, I felt like I was trapped in this mental bubble. I don't know how else to explain it, but it felt like I was trapped in this mental bubble above my body where I could look at my body and it just didn't feel like me anymore. Like I no longer felt like myself. I no longer felt grounded to the earth. I was just trapped in this mental reality alone with my thoughts and um, paranoia, anxiety and all that. And for the next 12 or 15 hours of trying to go to sleep, it just feels like I'm trapped in this mental reality. And I, I literally thought I was, I became brain damaged. That's what went through my mind at the time. So I thought I was, I was going to be permanently brain damaged. And when I get back to Perth, my parents would have to put me back in a mental asylum or something like that. Um, that's how it honestly felt at the time, because this has obviously never happened to me because I lost all control of my senses, all control of my thoughts, my emotions, and me being me, because um, those of you that know me, I, I sort of like to control things. So um, I like to be in control. So obviously when I'm trying to be in control and get back into my body and try to get control of the situation, that just heightened it because I realized I couldn't take control anymore. Um, so that just made it even worse because I thought I was going to be brain damaged. And finally, the next morning when I, um, after a long period of going through those emotions and feeling like I was living in a mental asylum, I was finally entered into a more Zen state of mind where everything just, like I just felt completely dreamy. Um, things that you see in the movie where people were just completely stoned and just looking around them like really curiously like a baby that was me for the next 12 hours or something I just felt really dreamy and just looking at everything like whoa that's so cool and like it's just really I was just really curious at everything and just looking at people's faces nothing felt real at that time like whatever I was looking at it just didn't feel real um, I was like there's no way this is real it just feels like a virtual reality um like I can control my body, but at the same time, I don't feel like I'm me anymore because I'm just controlling a character or something like that. And everything around me isn't real. That's kind of how it felt. Um, and then what happened was it made it worse because then I knew I had to catch the flight back home that, that very day. So um, I had to catch my way back and catch two um, flights while being completely high and being completely out of it. So that kind of find it more. Um, and intensified my emotions. But I noticed I was a lot more calm in that state because that was when I realized that it wouldn't last forever and I knew I was going to come out of it fine. So after I made that realization after talking to a few people, I realized that I was actually going to come out of this and I finally let go of needing to control the situation. And that was when I felt calm. And um, yeah, the next few days when I got back home, I was still sort of in that state, but almost back to normal. And that was when I integrated all the lessons of how I dealt with the anxiety at the time, what was actually the real reason that I was causing it. Um, like what I realized the emotions that I was feeling was actually being caused by certain things I was trying to control or do. Um, and yeah, I'm now in a place where I'm kind of just integrating all the lessons and using them to move forward in what I'm doing and uh, go from there. So that's my story. I know from your oh. perspective, Warren, you had different ex a different experience oh, yeah. today. So right. I think everyone would like to hear that. I'll share mine before I do. What was it you said to James again? What was the thing you said to him? Yeah, that's we'll <laughs> skip that part. That's the critical detail that we won't go through. <laughs> Edwards is Mr. Cool and controls his emotions. He's going to James. I love you. I really do. I won't remember of any of this when I come out and James remembered everything, but Anyone who knows Edward knows he just never ever does that. So it was he's been getting absolutely toasted about that ever since. But yeah, yeah, I my story, well, my story was similar. I mean, every I won't I won't go again over the same detail as before, you know, where basically Ed talked about how we got there. Me just go, oh yeah, let's just go and have a cannabis brownie. That looks fun, like a lolly or something nice and completely innocent, naive. And I'm I know Trent Chapman would be pissing himself laughing because he's on here. <laughs> and basically um yeah i so i get up there have one there and then the thing that i remember where i was different to them i had a very different reaction because when i first had it and they told me they were feeling high i'm like why would you be feeling high i said oh maybe that brownie had a bit more than i thought it did and i felt certain the only thing i noticed was that i felt so relaxed i thought the massage lady had done a really good job and and i managed to basically drive back I said to them, oh, well, I better drive your bike back and then I'll take a taxi back and pick you guys up, which I did. 
And when I came back, by now they're freaking out, like you wouldn't believe. And James is going like, you know, am I going to be safe? Am I going to be safe? I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then he almost walks straight into a car and I'm like, God, they're really out of it. And so I get them in the taxi and the taxi driver, poor guy, probably had no idea. They're going on about, please make sure we're safe and nothing bad is going to happen. And they're just totally tripping. So I, I followed them on the motorbike back to the resort and then I get them there and then I thought, God, I feel really wired, you know, I just want to walk. So I start walking around and feeling really awake. And then next minute I thought, this is like, this is pretty full on. I, I must have had, maybe it's got a bit more than I thought it did. So I wandered down to this um, clinic, which said medicinal marijuana clinic. And I thought, oh yeah, maybe they'll know what happened to me. So I told a girl and she goes, so how much did you eat? I said a brownie. She was like, how much? Half a brownie or what? I said, no, no, a whole brownie. She goes, you had a whole cannabis brownie. So the end, she goes, oh, she goes, me and my daughter have only cookie and we only have half each. That's strong. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> what's going to happen to me? And she goes, oh, you'll be fine. Just you're going on a long trip, you know, just enjoy trip. Just let go. Now, like Edward, I like to control my reality. It's one of my things that those who know me, it's my own little psychosis. Like, hidden beautifully you know I like to control my reality I don't I like to keep everything in its box um, that's why I liked being a lawyer when I did and I thought what the heck am I going to do I, I'm going and then I started I went back to the room I thought let's just get some sleep and sleep it off and I couldn't sleep I was just like Ooh, my head was going everywhere by now I'm freaking out thinking I'm going into an insane asylum I felt like mentally I was gone literally forever I felt like I was in the schizophrenic ward and all kinds of visions and weird shit was happening. I ended up going to the doctor and he passed, he pissed himself laughing and said, oh, we see this regularly and he put me on a drip and then I'm peeing like anything because he said they'll get it out of your system. And then, but he said, it'll take some time to get out because he said that's like four times a normal dose. And I'm, and yeah, and I was, next day I saw Ed and we were pretty much being each other's support therapists, the, the three of us. And um, I'm, I'm ringing just about everyone in Perth I can think of and Trent's on here. I'm ringing Trent and um, I'm ringing a couple of other people who knew about this stuff, new experts in the area and ringing a guy who I knew as a psychologist who's brilliant in the area and he was brilliant. He 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 walked me through it quite gently and um, was there and said, I'm here for you all day. And he said, normally, even on a quarter of a dose, you'd be doing it with a support therapist anyway, just to help you integrate the experience. But it just blew my mind open I literally had to slow myself down, like everything step by step, really focus. I I managed to finally get to the airport and I felt a lot more relieved. I slept in the lounge for the first time and had to be woken up for my flight. And then I got home and I went to sleep. And really, I went and saw John, John the psychologist, the next day. And the three of us were pretty much told, well, you had a profound experience and you've got a great opportunity to really awaken. And you've kind of had a disruptive awakening, like clearly, and the smile they gave was clearly the universe, you know, the plant, the spirits behind the plants or whatever, for you need a bit of a rocket up your ass and um, a bit of an awakening. And there is no doubt because what he told me was that this, you know, it heightens all of the real things in the unconscious. And I realized like, man, I had so much more anxiety than I realized. And it kind of shocked me. I was like, you know, I thought I was this pretty together guy and all that kind of stuff. But I thought, man, I really had some bad shit going on. And I had known it because I had been feeling this anxiety build. And through pure mental toughness, I've been able to move through it. But I was just like, yeah, man, I was falling apart. And my whole worldview and whole, whole unraveling. And I realized how much motivation I'd lost for a lot of stuff. And it shocked me, really shocked me. And it humbled me. I... My biggest takeaway from it for me was the ego and the humility it brought to me and made me realize that I'd kind of got into my head I was invincible, you know, that I was, you know, that I could get through just about anything. And I felt so vulnerable, you know, I felt I could go insane. I felt fragile. I felt like I really needed to be held. I needed support. I mean, <laughs> I was even saying things like, I just wish I had my mum cuddling me. I just want to go to my mum's house and be cuddled. And I'm, and those who know me know I've had like issues with my mum. And I'm like ringing my mum on Saturday night. We're having these long talks. I'm telling her I love her. And all, oh, God, it was just crazy. And, and, and yeah, and I think poor old Grace, of course, she was getting constantly called by me and, um, and, and that. But yeah, it really showed me my frailty and 
my need for a tribe and community and and the fact that in I've got some great gifts, but I really do. I valued my team more than ever. I valued Ed. I, I the love I had for, you know, I know Ed does not say loves, but my love I had for Ed and James and for and for people in my life and even every client. There's an appreciation I felt for every single client who'd ever trusted in us and thought, oh man, I just want to do so much deeper and greater service for every single client of the club and and lift my game in every way and improve my standard. I've been dressing for work every day, even at home. And those who knew me knew I was never like that unless on a webinar, but I wake up, I shave, I dress. Every task I'm doing from washing to making green tea for people to serving people in my life, I've just done this radical profound shift, which I'm going through. I worked, I've done more work in the last three days than I've done in the last probably month. And Ed, you, you agree. I cannot believe the clarity of focus I've got as I've integrated. My mind has never been so whole and clear. Like I have this ability to focus and see things like that I've never, that I've never had before. I can work and work and work and stay really focused and really inspired with no drifting and concentration. I've never had that before. Yeah, I know. I yeah. think we've all felt like that. There's so much focus right now. Like um, when you're in that state and even coming out of it, it feels like um, I'm just really narrow focused and find it a lot easier to concentrate, be um, keep persevering and all that and just a greater level of clarity with my life, what I want to do and all. Yeah, no, I just have this clarity. I Even last night, I know I woke up with this excitement and this passion and I thought, I haven't felt this excited about life since I was like in my 20s. I, I, I've i been wanting to play piano again. I'm a, For those who don't know, I was a very gifted piano player in my 20s. I used to play for hotels, for weddings. I played gospel in church. I write music. I had dreams to write music and get on the charts. And as life happens and trauma happens and dreams die, I put that aside. And I was saying to Ed, now I'm writing music. We're going to start doing our own music with Global Wealth Club. I was on the piano. I've noticed again, I... I, walk, I was in a cafe this day, like today even, in a cafe which one of my new cafes have gone, and they've got a piano sitting there. And I've gone to start playing piano, and everyone was clapping afterwards. And my desire to play music, my desire to connect more with Mother Earth. I, I, I just love Earth more than ever before. I love the trees. I love being connected to Earth and how she supports my soul and helps me stay in my body and gets me out of my fucking head when I start carrying on. And you know, and I just decided, and I made things right with a couple of people in my life, and I appreciated everyone, like Grace and people, and like, yeah, you know, I want to understand people better. I want to work with everyone better, be more, and I had greater compassion for people with mental health. My love for what people go through, and and my some of the harsh statements I'd made at times past. I thought, no, no, you know, we all agree that we're going to serve people as much as we can, and help help get help as much as we can. You know, people get through this coming change and. Yeah, I'm waffling a bit now, but it's just been profound. Mm. What about if you had to summarize it, what would you say was your biggest lessons that you learned from it um, that it showed you? Number one, that sometimes you need a big carrot up your ass <laughs> when you're stubborn and refused. To, <laughs> to yeah, do I'll, I'll unfortunately have to put my hand up for it. I'll, <laughs> I'll be the first to admit that I mean, I never. <laughs> I never even questioned that something was wrong with me and oh. anything like I never realized that or, or didn't cross my mind at all that something was wrong with me. But after that, massive carrot. Yeah, I think the second thing too was I realized how entitlement can creep into you in the Western world and you don't see the insidiousness of it. Like I sat there and thought, God, I mean, people in Russia and Europe would kill for some of the opportunities you got here in Australia. And here I've been whinging about this in my heart and and just not appreciating every little opportunity. And, you know, and I thought, man, I'm going to work harder than ever before. I mean, I'm a man. I've got, I've got purpose. I've got work. I've got people to serve. I've got people who, who trust me and I've got to lift my game. I've got to get stronger. So, yeah, it kind of smashed entitlement out. And I started to appreciate everything more and appreciate the importance of order in my life, just like plants are in order. That was a second lesson. The third one was the absolute importance of acknowledging yeah, the importance of mental health and having a good support network and building good community in your life and not being afraid to be vulnerable and having good support. And that and, and that's that's why Alcoholics Anonymous has been so successful because it gets people learning to be vulnerable and create support groups. And yeah, so that was another other big lesson, but also showed me that 
you know, yeah, you don't judge things too quickly. And there's no doubt about it. I mean, as we've since learned, Ed, having the kind of cannabis mushroom mix in a high dose like that, it was a shock, but it completely resets and rewires your brain. And it kind of does a self healing. And there's a good reason why Vietnam vets do that kind of stuff. And it really, once again, reinforced, I think for me, how much my future of my life is more in awakening people and really development, you know, the mind of the heart and the soul and spiritual awakening and finance is really just one part of it. So for me, it's given me a greater clarity of purpose has been a lesson and how much helping people to self heal and all that such a big part of my future. Mm, yeah, I think those are some good lessons. I think too, I'm, I'll generalize it. But the other one I was going to add from my end was how, how much we try to control things like that's more from my perspective is how much I was trying to control things that can't be controlled. Like sometimes you're better off just, um, so that was my one lesson I'll say, how much we control things that actually can't be controlled. And the other thing too, I'll mention my other lesson was how we, a lot of people focus on things that don't even matter. Like rather than just enjoying experiences along the way and focusing on what's important, people get so caught up in th attachments and things that don't matter. So for example, um, how, how attached people get to certain relationships rather than just letting go and enjoying the experiences. People let anxiety, like the fear of losing someone and the fear of losing money or something govern their actions rather than just enjoying what you have right now. Um, because that's a big lesson I learned is how, how much people don't allow themselves to enjoy what they have. They instead focus on things that just ge genuinely don't matter. Yeah, I think for me too, I learned a powerful tool to deal with overwhelm because for me, there's so much responsibility we've got, you know, with City Awakening, our church not-for-profit movement we're doing. Um, and for me, as you know, I like to control outcomes. I like to force things a bit along, control outcomes, had this and the Wealth Club and other different things I've been involved in. But the way I got to the way I got through that 24 hours, because honestly, that was the most terrifying 24 hours I've had since I can remember. And every minute felt like an eternity. And the way I really dealt with that in the end was very simple. I I went back to basic Buddhist mindfulness and I thought and, and I realized that there's always a beginning and an end to everything, you know, and everything ends. So all I was sitting there at the result thinking, I have three more hours and then I'll be on in the taxi. So my next mission is to spend the next three hours and manage to get through this okay, which I did. Step two was to get to the airport, which would take me one hour and 10 minutes. Step three was to, um, was to get through the airport lounge and I broke everything up into steps. And every time a step finished, I congratulated myself on the achievement. And the biggest thing I learned with overwhelm is to break up what seems an insurmountable series of tasks into steps and, and to acknowledge achievements. And William, who's here, my son, would know what I mean. We'd be having regular meetings on awakening stuff and stuff we do on clearing the etheric body and self-healing. And every day when we have a meeting, we acknowledge the achievements and we map out what we've done for the last few days. And then often we're amazed. So every day I go back over my achievements of the previous days and I commend what I've achieved. I look at where I can improve and I map everything out into a plan, into a blueprint. And then when I see there's too many tasks for me to do, there really genuinely is, I ask who can do this for me. And then I let go and allow systems and process to take over. Rather than force it, I let go. And even this morning, I had a powerful lesson when I woke up at 3.30, I'm seeing all these things to be done clearly, crystal clear. I then start to think, how am I going to do that? And as I was doing that, my head started to scramble. So I let go again and I just let go and I saw the thing and didn't think anything more of it. Six hours later, I'm talking to Grace and she and so and, and, and her and um Jack had already come up with a plan and already actually the very thing I'd been seeing, it was all it had been taken care of for me. And I'm like, wow. So it was another lesson about overwhelm, letting things take its process. And it's like right now we're in winter in Australia. I mean, some of you may remember at one stage was summer. It seems like a distant memory now, but at one stage it was blooming hot and we were all swimming. Now it's cold. In three months' time, it'll be slightly warmer again. In six months' time, it's going to be hot again and we'll be swimming. So everything ends. And it's really shown me something about the meaninglessness of what we do. So we make it meaningful and we just know it will end and we become as attached. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those, so those are pretty much our lessons if we were going to summarise it, but... 
Next point before we actually start going into the education we had planned, like what we learned ourselves through of how to cope with anxiety and mental health and all of these other challenges that people go through. While you were in this state, what problems did it actually make you realize um, that people face in today's world? Because obviously it highlighted what problems we were facing ourselves in those moments, but what did you realize um, other people go through based on your own experience and most likely what people listening to this are going through. If this is why you wanted to do this webinar, and I, and I think it's good to remind you, Ed, you said to me, the reason you wanted to speak was you said you really appreciate the opportunities you've been given, the fact that you had access to this John Thompson and through having parents who could help you, you were able to get tools to deal with it. But you said, how many people, Dad, don't have this opportunity? And so for me, I think people suffer... And they think they're all on their own because in the Western world, we're not very tribal. You know, we live in our houses on our own. We tend to stay away and we and we we get used to trying to deal with things on our own and feel tough. Whereas in tribal communities, as an, a good example, is raising children. Now, in a tribal community like the Philippines or Aboriginals, the tribe's involved in raising the kid. You know, like you guys, Grace's mum got very involved because Filipino, more tribal culture in the West. Oh no, your job, your parents, you do it. So suddenly the insurmountable task of raising children falls upon one or two people. And we've lost our ability to be tribal, community and bonding together. So if, I think people suffer a lot from that because I think we're meant to be supportive. We're meant to be tribal. We're meant to work together as men, as women and support each other. So to me, just on the pure theory of how psychology works, I think people go through a lot of suffering. I think people feel they're on their own. A lot of people have been reporting their heads going crazy, 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 crazy. Um, whereas then you find out that many other people are going through this and then you feel shame about that. Or, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll share this openly. When I went through my mental health work big breakdown 23 years ago, and as you know, one of the things with me, I've got no problem being pretty honest, but I remember sitting there terrified with my psychotherapist. It took me six weeks to to build myself up the courage to tell him my deepest, darkest, dirtiest, shameful sin. And finally, I said, there's something I want to talk to you about, which I need some help with, because honestly, I just said, it's eating me up and I don't feel I can ever be forgiven for it. And he goes, okay. And he obviously was big. And I said, I secretly masturbate at night. And he looks at me and goes, okay, yeah. And I said, no, you didn't hear me. I masturbate at night and have sexual thoughts. And he goes, yeah, you're, you and 99% other men. I said, don't make me feel better. You know, I know that's wrong. And he goes, no, I'm serious. He goes, where did you get that idea? And I go, really? So, uh, so it's normal. He goes, it's very normal. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and in that moment, I just felt this big relief. I thought, oh, thank goodness, because mum always said it was really dirty and my church did. Oh, okay. Now, I had other stuff to work through, but that's just one idea, you know, example. And in this whole situation that I think a lot of people are experiencing things that they feel they're on their own or suffering to cope with the change with what, what's happened in the world and with COVID and are too on a way too scared to admit how much you're struggling with all the change and the fear of the future. Like imagine you're a farmer or imagine you're just an Australian who's got a retirement fund of security. You're hearing about recession. You're looking at your future. You're older. I mean, you'd be shitting yourself, you know? So. Hmm. That's for sure. And out of curiosity, because we, I got saw a comment that I used to feel like I was on my own until I started my healing journey. Um, how many of you guys listening to this resonate with what Warren was saying about problems that you may be facing, like whether you feel alone in this or anything? Um, anyone relate to what was just said there? Like just raise your hand or type a Y. Yeah, William, you have. I mean, I definitely felt like that in the moment. felt like I was all alone with my mental health. Like when I felt like I was living in a mental asylum, but then just... Even just knowing that James and you were going through it in that moment too, just knowing that there's actually other people going through it with me kind of relieved me a bit. And even just listening that other people go through it as well. And when I hear that it's more normal, that definitely helped me a lot. Um, so yeah, we've got quite a few people who resonate with what you just said there. Um, but anyway, to move forward, are you ready to get into the actual education that we had yeah. and the lessons that we learned? Yeah, just 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 share them. Let's just summarize. I don't need to do a big long two hour thing, but let's just you know just go through the point. Just go through your lessons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because what we wanted to go through today was actually share the lessons that we learned. Because the state that we were in, when we felt like we were trapped in a mental asylum, 
I know that I realize a lot of people actually feel like that where even if it's not mentally, people feel like they're trapped in a lifestyle or they feel like they're trapped in their, re in their reality they can't escape. A lot of people also feel like they've lost com complete control, like especially in a situation like COVID and now with this whole pharma law being passed, people now feel like they've lost com complete control over um, something that they had before. And that's what creates a lot of anxiety, fear, scarcity and stuff for the future. Um, as we were taught by a psychologist. So um, what we wanted to do was just share our own. Firstly, what we'll do is we'll go through seven principles that I kind of learned through this experience that I think can relate to a lot of you. But like I said, take what you will and um, which parts relate to you. It may help you, it may not, but um, I think you'll like it. And the second part that we'll go through is eight practical steps that you can actually follow to overcome anxiety or even if it's not anxiety if it's just holding on to emotions if it's just fear or anything like that eight steps that you can apply to overcome and what we personally did while we were in that state to make it back home to our room um, even though we were high as a kite going through the airport and feeling like we were trapped in a mental asylum so hopefully this helps i won't spend too much time on it i'll summarize it um, if we need to go longer, we'll run a separate training for that or maybe turn it into a blog and send it out to everyone in writing or in a video, but um, this is more going to be an overview, overview and summary. So I'll share my perspective on the seven principles um, to deal with this stuff, and then if you have anything to add, Warren, after I finish, feel free. Um, my first principle for what I learned during the whole experience was being comfortable losing control. That's number one. Whenever there's a situation you've got yourself into or you feel like you've got yourself into, um, either whether it's a traumatic thing, whether it's um, something that governments have put or anyone else, or whether you've put on yourself, like number one, you have to be comfortable losing control. Looking back on the whole experience, the reason why I was so panicking and paranoid um, that I was going to be trapped in a mental asylum and I'd be have to, I'd be permanently brain damaged just because I was trying to control something that I couldn't, that I should have just let go and just enjoy the experience. I was trying so hard to control it when I, when I couldn't. So how many people do you see in today's world, especially people going through mental health challenges who try to control something that they actually can't? Um, there's some things that are supernatural and some things that are, um, more out of your control so just understand what's in your control and what's not and then be comfortable letting go it, it's easier said than done so um if you do struggle letting go of control then you also want to make sure you have the right people around you which is going to be another principle i'll get into at the end so that's number one be comfortable losing control number two recognize what's causing your fear or anxiety and face it head on rather than trying to hide or deny from it so um, what I mean by that is I thought the drug was causing my fear and I thought um, my emotions were causing my fear and anxiety in that moment. But in reality, the real root of the problem that I was facing was just my the feeling of complete loss of control and the fear of being brain damaged. So as soon as I realized the whole thing that was causing my anxiety and making me feel heightened emotions was the that I lost control and that's the real thing I was fearing was my loss of control I instantly calmed down so after I recognized that was the actual cause of my problem then I faced it let go and noticed myself being a lot more calm so if you are going through any if you're feeling any emotions like fear anxiety or anything like that separate the emotions from the actual problem that you're facing so you may feel anxious but that anxiety would have to be coming from somewhere. So identify what it is, dig deep and find out what is actually causing your emotions. And then rather than hide it or let yourself feel anxious, um, identify it and then work on it from there. Number three, realize that nothing lasts forever. That was the other thing too, which I realized. Um, I, I thought the whole thing would last forever. So that was another thing that was causing a lot of anxiety for me was that I thought this would be forever. And I thought I would be have to be put in a mental asylum trapped in a room with my thoughts so as soon as I realized that this is actually normal and that when you take cannabis this actually happens like when you overdose this is a normal thing that happens um, and that it wasn't going to be forever I also calmed down so just knowing it wouldn't last forever and I know Warren briefly touched on it before that um, summer passed like three months ago and we forget it it just feels like a distant memory 
So same thing with any problems you face. I'm sure if you sit down and look at problems that you had in your in your life, you probably at the time thought they'd never end. Like maybe if you went through a heartbreak, if you went through health challenges, at the time you would have thought it would never end. But you look back on it now and realize that it actually helped you grow or, or something like that. So yeah. if you are going through challenges now, just remember that, that it won't last. And as long as you take action, you'll get through it. Principle four is following on from nothing lasts forever. But principle four is focus on enjoying the moment and creating worthwhile experiences because knowing that nothing lasts forever, rather than holding on to the problem that you're facing, just allow yourself to enjoy the moment and create experiences from it. And I know that kind of sounds a bit fluffy or spiritual, whatever you want to call it, but that's just the reality. If you just let yourself enjoy the experience rather than focusing on the future or something or focusing on potential problems, then um, that's what you want to do. A good example of this to give a more practical sense, if, if you're feeling anxious about losing a relationship like a loved one, let's say, um, I know a lot of people who are in relationships just um, even they don't allow themselves to fully enjoy it because they um, are worried about losing their partner or something like that and they fear the worst. But instead, rather than thinking about that, the reality is the relationship is never going to last forever. And just if you can accept that, um, it might last longer than you think. It might last shorter. But rather than thinking about the future, just let yourself enjoy that experience. And um, for me, that's what I had to do in that moment. Just enjoy it and let myself enjoy the trip. Principle five, moving on from that, is realizing that your thoughts create your emotions. Most people let themselves be consumed by their emotions when they're in mental health challenges. But realize that even though you're feeling the emotions and feeling them being heightened, rather than allowing yourself to be consumed by it, realize it's actually your thoughts that are creating it. Um, and if you haven't identified the root cause of your emotions and what's feeding that, then you're always going to be stuck with those emotions. So remember that your thoughts are creating it. So use your thoughts um, to do good rather than using it to feed your emotions. So always be mindful of what you're thinking. Um, number six is always have clear, tangible goals you can focus on. During this state that we were in, we noticed that our vision became so narrow and we were so focused on whatever we needed to do that we achieved them really easily. So um, whenever you're in a normal state and whenever you've got goals, that will help you stay focused. And even if you're going through challenges and problems, if you've got a goal that actually means something to you, then you'll be able to ignore those problems and be able to work through them just because you have a goal. So for example, me knowing I had to get back home and go through the airport and get on the plane and all that, everything in me wanted to zone out and wanted to try to um, fight the high that I was in. But just knowing I had to get back home and get through the airport while I was being high helped me stay grounded and helped me stay conscious and get through it. So just having a goal to focus on helped me actually stay focused rather than zoning out. Number seven, the last principle that I've got here is surrounding yourself with the right people and support network. Now, I can tell you if I was alone in that whole experience, I probably would be dead by now because I probably would have walked across the road and been hit by a car or something like that. But um, having people around me who are also going through it and also to guide me um, when I wasn't in the right state of mind, that helped me get through it and made it a lot easier. So whether it's your family members, whether it's uh, a good like expert in the field, whether it's in finance or psychology or whatever challenge you're going through, um, find the right experts and family or friends that can help you get through it and be a good support for you. And support doesn't mean just lovey-dovey and like telling you how great you are and appreciating you and things like that. That's definitely good support. But another version of good support is people who can challenge you. Um, if you're not doing good or if you're not, uh, you know, if you're being lazy or something, people that can challenge you, that's another good um, version of support just people who want your best interests at heart is what I mean by that so um, that wraps up my principles whether you're going through financial challenges mental health or anything like that I think these principles can be applied to any of them but for the sake of this topic I've kept them more focused on mental health but anything you want to add to that before we move on Warren no, I think it's perfect. I mean, definitely about being comfortable losing control, or I prefer to say that first one, surrendering to the process, you know, losing control and surrendering to the process, because naturally we try and be outcome focused and rush to the end. 
and rather than just going being comfortable with the journey and going for the ride and that was my biggest thing and so yeah that's about my only comment otherwise what you put about tangible goals and support and network and you know focusing on what you want not on what you don't want about being very mindful that's a big one you know for me big big one so yeah that's yeah let's go straight to the next one let's be efficient yeah so we were going to go through some eight practical steps to actually um deal with it did you want to go through that warren or is there not enough time? yeah i reckon go through that i reckon we just keep it simple we've got another nine minutes so just make sure just go one per minute and then that means at the end we can go through and share what what's next yeah what i'll do is i'll i'll condense this and make it more of a summary so we can get through this um in a matter of time because we do only have about a one hour time limit on this but what we'll do is we will probably do a part two on it to actually go into more detail so we can run a proper education on it. But yes. for the sake of time, I'll condense it. Just today, just do a quick summary, give people a sneak preview, and then we'll be doing a follow-up webinar to go through this in more depth. Yeah. So eight steps to deal with mental health challenge or, or whatever it is, whether it's finances, like I said, these can be applied anywhere. Practical to... steps for anxiety, yeah? Yeah, for anxiety, practical steps. So... Number these follow on from the principles. So the principles govern it, but the action steps are what you go out and actually do. Um, keep that in mind. So step one, recognize and own the fear or anxiety you're facing. Don't deny or try to hide from it. That's what we have to do. That's number one. Always, rather than trying to hide from it or control it, firstly, recognize it and own the fear and the root cause of your anxiety. So identify it. Once you've identified it, Step two is to discover what the underlying cause of the fear is. So um, firstly, own the emotions you're facing. So if you're feeling anxious, own that you feel anxious. Then number two is discover what's causing that anxiety. So if emotions like you shouldn't, you wouldn't be feeling emotions unless there was a reason behind it. So identify what that reason is and the cause of it. Number three, calm your mind down. Um, especially when you're in a vulnerable state, you'll notice that your emotions are heightened and you'll notice that um, they are really intensified. So once you've identified, rather than giving into it, calm your mind down and just surrender to it. Yeah, breathing um, is really helpful for that. So to calm your mind down, just breathing and slowing down your focus can help to calm you down. Yeah. yeah. Once you've calmed your mind down, you feel more calm and peaceful rather than anxious or, or fearful, whatever emotion you're going through. Number four is create a, I've called it a big goal, but let's just call it a main goal for now. So create your main goal and associate it with a tangible outcome. So in my case, my big goal was getting back to safety. When I was in my in that state, all I could think about was being safe and getting back to safety. Um, now, safety isn't really tangible. So that was my main goal. Safety was my main goal. But my association with safety was getting back home in my bed in Perth. That was my tangible outcome goal, where safety safety was the main goal, but my association with it was getting back home in my bed in Perth because I knew that was where I'd be safe. So that was my main goal. Once you've got that goal really clear, next step is to break your goal into micro goals. So let's say, for example, um, in my case, once I knew my goal was to get back home, I then break it down. Like first, I had to get in the taxi from the resort and to the airport. So I was able to focus really clearly on getting in the taxi. Nothing else mattered at that moment. All I could think about was getting in the taxi and getting back home. So I go in the taxi to the airport. Once I was in the airport, that was my first micro, micro goal ticked off. Once I was in the airport, my next goal was to get on the plane and board the plane. So I went through airport customs, no issue, and waited in the lounge area and got on the plane. That was my next goal tipped off. Then I had a series of goals set in my mind that all eventually led to the big goal, which was safety and getting back in my bed. So whatever um, thing you're going through, whatever you're trying to achieve in your life, create a big goal, an, emotion, an emotional goal, and have a tangible outcome with it, and then have micro goals, which you focus on achieving. Next, step six is surround yourself with the right people and support network because when you're around the right people who can support you and challenge you, you'll notice that um, you achieve your goals much quicker and much easier and it feels a lot more easier. Once you've got the right people around you, step seven is to then focus on achieving one micro goal at a time um, while also making sure you don't lose sight of the big goal. So achieve your micro goals with the right people around you without losing sight of the big goal. So 
always have the big goal in the back of your mind while you're achieving the small goals and eventually you'll get there. And then step eight is celebrate the small wins. So um, always making sure you recognize when you take something off and celebrating it because it's good for your mind to actually um, feel like it's achieving stuff. And you'll notice that that helps you overcome any emotion you're feeling because you feel like you're getting one step closer rather than feeling like it's going to be forever. So those are my steps I've put together. Anything you want to add to that, Warren, or not? Um, no, look, I think, again, if you... The, other, the only other thing I'd mention is what John Thompson, the guy, uh, said to me. He goes, the, the feeling of anxiety and the feeling of excitement are very similar. So he said, you just got to ask, is it actually anxiety? Because sometimes it is. And I had this, I realized that it definitely was anxiety when I was going through what I was going through. But two nights ago, I felt anxious again. And I noticed it wasn't actually anxious, it was excitement. I actually felt my liberated and excitement. So just also when you saying identified at the source of it, sometimes you don't know exactly what it is, but you just ask, you know, what, you know, as much as you can, do I have a basis or reason that I'm anxious? And it did actually help me with that thing. Once I realized the biggest reason for my anxiety in Thailand was my loss of control and the fact that I wasn't in my home country and away from my place of safety. As soon as I got a, a plan to start moving back home to a place of safety, I calmed down straight away. So that's probably the only thing I'll mention in a practical sense. Yeah, that's a good tip. And I've also put them down in the chat for you, like the principles and steps in the chat, if you guys want to copy and paste it so you can Brilliant. actually read it. Um, but that's pretty much the lessons that I learned. Feel free to give your comments or thoughts on it, everyone in the chat um, as we wrap things up. But yeah, that pretty much wraps it up for me from my end. Um, what I know we're running and you have announced in the past, Warren, is a workshop to actually learn more about this because over the next few weeks, we're going to be running this series, breaking these lessons down to deal with anxiety and coping uh, with trauma or whatever else um, over the next few weeks. So there will be more free trainings coming. But for people more interested in learning this in greater detail and more practical steps, can you share a bit more about the workshop you're doing? Yep, sure. Look, we're doing a workshop, although it's... It's what's happened is that the last few weeks, I've really had this desire to take a lot of the work I'm doing in terms of energy and changing the way you're thinking and running a workshop. And it all came about because in recent times, I started using a lot of this to do self-healing. Like when I was getting not feeling well by the power of intention and just checking my thoughts out. And I was astonished. And, and I actually went to a homeopath who used a machine who is measuring my stress levels my where I was out and it showed for example I was stressed and needed certain remedies so then I just said let, let me just do some work and I got him to video me while I was doing some intention work and imagining the whole thing fixing doing energetic work and self-healing he retested me and it showed I'd fixed it and we got a series of videos where I did this and it was like wow this is really great and so it's actually saved me a fortune in supplements <laughs> that's the first thing because um, I've noticed I've been in the best health I've just about been in physically, which has now given me the opportunity to focus on my mental health and even starting to apply these principles to that. So we're going to be running a program called, you know, how to heal yourself. And we're going to start doing a, what we call a be your own physician kind of series. And this workshop's a one day workshop in July, and it's going to be teaching people to self heal and the principles of, of that. They're going to be based on a mixture of the scientific latest development in quantum science, in the etheric body, in what causes imprints in the mind, in the body, in the spirit. And then there's going to be more stuff come out of that one. That'll be a foundational um, training. There's going to be stuff about be your own physician of the mind. And we'll be doing work on, around the mental and the trauma and emotional clearing and how to clear trauma. Because again, we've been using a lot of this stuff to clear trauma. And I honestly believe one of the reasons we got such a huge shift was all the work we've been doing leading up to it, to clear traumas, release things from our etheric body. And newest medical science is now showing that the etheric body, in the same way mental health has, was the next level of evolution, which wasn't recognized, say, 20 years ago as it is now, in 10 years, even five years, the importance of clearing the etheric body or energy body and how it will transform and make it easier for the mind to deal with things is going to be the next level of evolution. So this is going to be the first kind of workshop we're doing in our series and teaching people around the power of the etheric body and knowing how to clear this and fix this up. And this can apply with your physical health. That's where I've seen the best results have been in my physical health, but I've also seen it in my 
definitely my mental health and my mind and being able to clear blocks and traumas and things like that. And definitely even in my financial health and getting more clarity. And as an example, I always had a bit of a tendency with my finances to do, I get to a certain level and then it would just stop. And then it would kind of implode at a certain point um, with certain things. And I discovered by doing this work that I had certain, what I call tears in my etheric field. And again, this is the etheric body is the, the next body just around, around the body and then around the mind. And once I was able to work and clear the etheric body, generally within four to six weeks or two to six weeks, it, it starts to manifest and sort itself out in the physical body. So, or in the, or in the mental realm. Um, sometimes in the mental realm, it can only take three days. A good example was I had 10 years of gallbladder issues, which just weren't fixing. As soon as I managed to fix it on the etheric level, I've never had gallbladder problems since, literally. Um, no need to do long fastings, anything like that. So this is really revolutionary stuff. And one of the reasons I'm doing this one-day workshop, we're deliberately keeping the price um, at a really, really good price. We've got it basically, it's although it's, it's, it's $347, but $275 up front. It's $250 um, early bird, but still but only till the end of today. Now it finishes tonight. So a lot of you have noticed on here already booked for this workshop and coming, so that's fine. Um, just you can send privately or whatever on the chat. Is there anyone here who'd be interested in this workshop? Come along and be there tonight who's not already booked. Just kind of type a Y in a chat or send it to us privately. Or raise your hand. Yep, getting a few, getting a few people. Yep. Yep, so strongly encourage you if you're not already booked in to come along to this one. And yeah, this is this is a really good foundation on the on the mental health. And this will give you a lot of foundation because we'll be doing a lot of teaching on mind body. And that's been the thing that fixed me of, of stuff that just wasn't fixing. Like, for example, stuff on asthma, eczema, psoriasis, um, sinuses. I had hay fever for years and this kind of stuff fixed my hay fever completely, got me off drugs. Asthma, I had 33 years of asthma. This stuff fixed my asthma. Um, I had like gallbladder, fixed gallbladder. I had a constant back issue that every single thing I did, and I did everything to fix it, kept coming back, ferric body stuff, fixed it. So this stuff, I, could, I just, I can't speak highly enough of how powerful this actually works. And one of the reasons why my plan is just to move more and more into this one, because I believe the world needs this kind of stuff and not just the physical body, but as I said, the mental health body. So yeah, anyway, that's, that's a bit about the workshop. But it's not it's not just your health also that sorting out the mind like when you get on top of your mind it's not just your health that sorts out but everything else like yeah. finances for example like i didn't realize the importance of the mind until i was in that state and literally all i was able to feel was my mind and nothing else i didn't realize how important being in control of it was because it affects the way you focus with your finances and how much how you create your money and income it affects the way even just something as simple as um, having the desire to clean your house. Like I know you, Warren, you've been saying how you've just got an urge to keep the house clean. Whereas those of you that know Warren, he would never clean the house or anything like that. But now we've got that urge to actually look after the house. So yeah. anyone who's a, who doesn't like cleaning the house, but knows you need to clean it. That's, a, that's another good thing about it, is that maybe you'll become a better person and be able to look after that. Um, and it just sorts out a lot of things by having control over your mind and, knowing how to be your own physician. Yeah. Well, I reckon we'll definitely do a part two of this. And yeah, so look, this workshop, if there's anyone here who we do do also specific work in helping clients to this as well. So you can always, you know, message us privately and things like that. But yeah, we encourage you to book in for the workshop and come along. And who's found this useful today anyway? Um. While people are typing, I guess the tip that you and I can give Warren, like we've already given our tips more than anything, try to avoid taking a full cannabis brownie in a foreign country when you've got a flight <laughs> the next day. That's what I. That's my final tip of dealing with anxiety is is know what you're doing and don't eat a full cannabis brownie before you have to go back home on a plane. Yeah, it's it's definitely. Uh... Look, I think, yeah, my big tip is definitely being mindful. And that means thinking things through, looking into it without jumping into things. It's a time to jump in and leap and definitely learnt a very humbling lesson. And 
yeah, don't go to Thailand and, and basically go, oh, I'm going to have a cannabis brownie and without at least thinking it through. So it's it's definitely, I, I laugh about it now, it's changed our life. But yeah, it was certainly a, a ride to remember in every way. Yeah, oh, Grace, take it no, home. You mean it was a nice trip to remember. Yeah, well, I've, I've, the funny thing is I've met a lot of people since who actually had the same experience. They've said, oh, yeah, I've done that. I'm like, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, one of my joint venture partners in business, she said, oh, yeah, I made that mistake. <laughs> and she said, oh, it's like stone as a kite. The funniest was John Thompson, the psychologist we're seeing. He said his teenage son, he went into the fridge and by mistake, um, you know, he's basically there'd been some kind of brownie or whatever from someone had left had left at their house or whatever and he wasn't aware of the whole thing or something like that or didn't 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 realize there was even one there and the son just saw it and thought it must be a chocolate brownie and ate it and was stoned like anything <laughs> and it was completely like a genuine like no one knew but it was actually in the fridge and the whole thing was just yeah so he he, he was freaking out but got some support so it's a common it, it has happened to other people you do recover, you don't die, but yes, it certainly taught us a lot. And hopefully, um, yeah, we'll be doing a lot more in this to share and, and just give some support. Mm. All right, well, okay. and thanks guys for attending. Hopefully you took out some useful information from Dan. Um, we'll upload the replay to YouTube if you want to rewatch or catch up on certain parts and we'll be sent to your emails and we'll also share um, what we have coming up in the next few weeks to continue this series in more detail. So that's it from me. Any final words from you, Warren? No, just thank you everyone for trusting us and coming along and listening in. And, you know, I mean, I'm not, I mean, look, it's just our experience. There's going to be others who've got things to share in this area. Um, but I, and hopefully this will, um, you know, serve you in your journey and start to help the whole world transition be a lot easier for everyone. And, for those of you who come along to the workshop and are already booked in or going to book in tonight, looking, it's going to be 8th of July on Saturday. We look forward to helping you get to the next level in your health. I'm going to be giving you my best. I can promise you that. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. And stay tuned for what's next. See ya. See ya. Bye.